Okay, folks, uh, next up here is the Blade Runner. Um, the Blade Runner is a kill bug. This is a bug that we are going to use when we're playing to the idea that a, a broken or dying or just, just dead fish is a huge piece of the um, sales pitch when we're fishing these streamers is anybody that's been doing this long enough sees that the the death of a fly or the the slowing or paused or just dead fly um, tends to grab a lot of our bigger takes these days so <laughs> it's just a high commitment thing it's another bite trigger when a, a fish dies it's another bite trigger outside of an injured fish an injured fish is still something that needs to be chased versus this fly which is catering to the idea that it has just died therefore it's a fresh fish that does not need to be chased and if it doesn't need to be chased and it's a fresh fish for a brown trout whether he's in the state of predation or not it's kind of his job to at least go and take care of that or that's a missed opportunity on his behalf so we're trying to trigger a bite based upon the death of a fish and the death of a fly what we've done here is taken a couple of nice whiting saddles this one here is a grizzly natural you can see one side of this has got kind of a nice little back whatever and then you got a little underbelly here we fork the tail here to kind of square up those edges, give a little fish look there. And we're not going to do this quite as long as a triple D. This is in the family of the, the drunken disorderly. We are making another paper airplane. But we are trying to make one that follows a different lateral persuasion versus the dig and grabbing of a current. We are using the glide and almost surf of the current to promote for most of this fly's would be swim action. We are still darting, we are still turning and, and moving a fly, but we are no longer digging a fly into the current. We're trying to get this thing to kind of um, surf out, break, look very, very uh, vulnerable and, and open. In, in your um, in the way that you're fishing it is that going to straighten there we go and so unlike making the rudder of a triple we're going to make a lateral we're going to have this thing kind of sitting back and kind of cupping the water instead of sliding and, and ruddering it we're going to we're just going to kind of keep it on the underside. Now, I'm going to try and get up under here and give it some reinforcement here on that underside just to keep that tail from wanting to do creepy stuff. And we got that locked in. Again, we've got a nice plane here. We're going to go in here and do use the, the nicer whiting saddles having these, I mean, we're still butter knifing this whole affair, but now we're doing it in more of a, a, a sway than a, than a slip. So, add some of your polar flash here. Stuff you could, it's like a food group with streamers. I say two thirds back. Give that a nice little spread. And come in here with your uh, married uh, polar chenilles. You can use a couple of different colors. This is just a, a base recipe. So, you know, depending on the fish forage that you're trying to mimic, you can always play with the variety of colors between, you know, Senos Aquavale and the polar chenilles and the reflector flashes and all the different variations of the same theme which is glitter on a braid here and we're gonna make our first turn again try and spread these materials out we're trying to 
build a lot of the profile of the lower end of a fish in just this material marriage here. And the Blade Runner again is not a straight strip walk as we have been known to use with the the drunk series. This is more of a a gallop style presentation in the lift and strip only real differences being that you are using a um, a severe amount of slack in the intermission of those um, little lift and pop programs so after you get a few 10 and a lot of your body built here try not to bunch up too much on that tip with that material we're gonna add a little bit of bunny here just to make sure we've got a little bit of mass in our fly and we are looking for this is that really nice groovy strip that Caroline's doing these days. It's multicolored, barred bunny, and it gives a lot more dimension than just the single color stuff. There we go. Just a few of those will do. We, we don't want to make that too massy back here because we, we're really going to beg a lot of shimmy from that rear get that nice base there got your material coverage tails in check now we're going to go after some foul and flank we'll take two small standards and we're going to kind of tent this happening on the upward half of this hook placement and this so to kind of taper the uh, the sides of this so to make it want to be pulled in a right or a left fashion in most cases. So we take one there on one side and you can kind of tent this as much as you do side it just so long as everything remains on the top and almost pushing down slightly on those lateral saddles back there so that they stay in line with the uh, whoop, lost that right there there we go and once you've got those both together you can give that a whip finish and what we've done here is we've had two rudders against each other we've got a side fighting a tail lateral which is just the opposite of the drunk series but in the same church so again what you have here is that kind of lateral look you know you've got a little bit of fiber there a little body there but again, you've got that cupping and that, that yaw there that kind of keeps these things. And tuning is never bad either. Always kind of make sure all your rudders are in place. You got that nice little slither that kind of looks like the back of a fish and then the belly. So you get that and then we're going to go after a very unique hook style. We're going to be tying with a Texas style hook here, which is a bit against the grain, but working. We're going with some wire into our lateral here. And we are going to spin this in such a way that the hook is upside down. So we are going. for a one up one down hook and again we're going to tie that in in such a way that it's back up we'll leave a little bit bigger teardrop than normal on these two to get a really good sway spring out of that bite wire bike there which is a 40 pound two beads in between 
lock it in and we want to build the nest in such a way that the the rattle can sit on the bottom of this hook which we will make the bottom once we turn it upside down so we're going to tie that in here nice little cradling there of the wire for a sit we're going to tie that just back in here we don't want to go way too far down the hook on this one and take a little bit of your polar flash here for that coverage. Let's get that kind of belly spread there, top half of the flash, which you'll take and cut right about at the hook point in the rear pattern. So once you come back up in here, just past that hook point maybe, get that little belly coverage and then we're going to skip the bunny that we would normally do on a D as that created a little too much drag and we're going to go right with the polar. This one here you can use kind of a larger rattle too because we're kind of using the bearings and the placement of it as much as a weight um, to keep that, that belly riding nice and low. So you can use two large beads here and with that lift and jig tech that we're using, um, that style of present really helps with the, uh, I mean it'll get the rattles clinking. So we're going to tie in our big mess of bearing and glass here on the bottom what now is the top of the hook take our polar and size this up correctly and this is that reflector flash tan in here that uh, kind of helps give a little bit more mass to the body versus just the straight polars but a nice mix of the polar gives a, a nice color variation in there as well so each little hangover kind of get that nice little pull out and again we're trying to make all of the forward body happen in this this one amount of uh, wrap and glass that's going to give it a little bit of more dimension for us There we go. It's kind of spinning weird this one. So again this Texas style right now being rigged from the top to be on the bottom. Kind of spread out your fibers just a little bit for that width. Hook upside down. And a little bunny mass in here. There we go. take two flanks here and we're going to try like making a big spoon here we're trying to make a platform for fall and glide and so we want to size these up so they cover a lot of the first hook and even some of the second hook because this is going to be falling now in this step here we're going to take and flip our hook so that we can get this little flop over and we want this to carry into just over and touching those rear small flanks. Nice rounded out. As soon as you get your basic size kind of 
relative to where you want these things. Try and cut off the ends. It makes it easier to kind of splice them into the hook here a little bit. There we go. That's about right. And do be advised that that um, jig hook is in a very precarious position and does want to get you. I hate that little hook point where it's at. You're always thinking about it, you know what I mean? Stay flat. Stop rolling. We're going to add a little bit more flash. Kind of get that spread out through the top. And again, with this bug here, we're trying to get a kill out of it. So having these little flash tips on one side versus all the way around are the comings and going of that side that shows off equilibrium in a fish's um, demeanor and that triggers oftentimes a fish from a much better distance uh, seeing that kind of injury so prevalent. And just a couple of wraps here, getting that nice shoulder build here though. Okay, most of this fly is right here in the head of this. The groovy strips are really nice for getting dimension for not doing a whole lot there. You get a whole lot of color and look out of not a whole lot. And then comes your guinea fowl. I hate that hook where it's at though. Makes this thing such a fly to... That one's set up pretty good. Okay, one more stage of bunny. Bring it right into that head. My favorite stuff here. As thick as that is, I'm almost thinking about doing just one full wrap, like a one and a half, you know what I mean? Got it. Oh, direct thumb hit there. There we go. So, this is entirely our body here. Guinea fowl on the back, a little spotting. And like I said, not a fun hook. You will work your thumb over doing this. This one costs blood. Uh, or put a cork over it. <laughs> Isn't that right, Nick? Put a cork over it. Now don't stick yourself. So this head is um, not fun. 
the end of it's not too bad. Cutting is fairly easy, but the centering of this one is a little bit of a project and a little messy to start. So this pattern will evolve, I'm sure, and this will be an easier maneuver eventually. But right now it's kind of painful, but we still do it because it's swimming pretty good. We're going to cover that that bunny up as best we can. We want one or two pulls and then a good cinch down to get that kind of collar nice and locked up. As soon as we get that locked up, we're going to go for a minor spread just to make sure that's covering the whole top of that hemisphere. And then we really want to push this back on down. We want to get back into the, the core of this, um, this pattern here because we have to get to the bottom still and we have to add a little bit there for the chin that is on the incoming. So the chin here is a big piece of the puzzle because we need an axe-like chin in this to enhance the fall of this pattern. So being that it's not weighted we want a head that is writing in the top but encouraged to go much lower and that's what we're going for here. So we're going to tie this guy off down here at the base which is never as easy as it looks which is just like I said messier than you'd like. And we're going to come over here to the back side trying to stay on that lower level of the hook. <coughs> and then we're going to take one more bead of that same, maybe just smaller. And we're going to rotate this in right on the top back side as we've used most of that material in the first step of this deer body for the collar. So on this one, we want to use a little bit more of the chin action for the, the hold spot. So I'm going to give it three good wraps and then I'm going to go back in just to make sure that the doesn't want to come back up that hook. Then I'm going to come right back over and I'm going to make sure that I've got a semi good hole between all these. Find the bottom of that V by pushing down on that material yet again and as best you can you want to get your thread to kind of spin one more cut right through there so that you can get up on top of that Z and then once you're up there and you've got a nice clean base again which is never as easy as it looks with this pattern there we go, a little scissoring there there we go once you're there you're going to take that third step of deer and get it on the the back of that Z stem headed up. So a little bit of an angle with your bobbin. We're going to kind of add that one pull, two pull just to make sure that's heading on its way down and then cinch it on in there and then go again for the front of that hook. So I'm way up there again. Let me see if I can push a little bit of this back down now. There we go. Got our third step in there, going for four. And this now should be coming to the very top back of the Z of this Texas style hook. So you should be at this point of the the pattern kind of coming right to the the top bridge of this Z. And you want to lock that in on the back as best you can. Because you want to get a couple more steps if possible right up here on the front. Now this is a, a consuming pattern as far as the the time that it takes to kind of get all this deer in place but once you get this built you'll have kind of two hemispheres on this head of 
of deer that's helping it kind of surf and cut here. And it definitely cuts up better than it spins, so it looks worse early. So here's number five. And that gets up in there. You can start using your packer now. Up on the bridge. One in front for that lockdown. Another little two. It's okay to have some of this definitely slip up under the hook too because again we're building some chin as much as top here. And then the last step here, and that's six. It's kind of like five and a half because a couple of those are a little smaller just to get that centered out. And then right here is our number six. And again, those last few four steps are much easier than those first two deer steps on this one. But that collar is important. And we want to make sure we have enough chin to cut that, that axe out of the bottom. So that's why we chase it down a little bit. And we'll kind of get this thing righted out. A little spin there for some extra pull tension. And mind that hook because it is unforgiving on this pattern. That is GSB, so you pull that down like it's it's not going to come out. Remember, all these threads and materials they have a tendency to swell and open a bit, just a bit, when they're wet. So the tighter you can pull on them, the less play you're going to get during that interval of relax. There we go, and that's a bingo on the body. So what we've got here is again, you got kind of that spoony back with that kind of trailing forward, but we've still got plenty of body under there too to kind of indicate the, the pattern's mass, as it were. Again, those little flanks and cups on the top here just they really kind of cut and open on that fall to kind of create this kind of glide. But on the back of this pattern, I've allowed for a little bit more wire so that you actually get a bounce out of that tail because of the directional of this fly. So the lift and jig really makes that wire kind of springboard this material in the back once this stuff back here is wet and being jigged from the forward bottom. So again, kind of a weird looking fly as far as the deer when we get it all messed up here. I mean, there's layers of it here, and we're going to try and cut this down into basically like a mohawky side type thing where we are building a right of a fly. So, first things first, we're going to flip this thing right up on its side. And if you want, what you can do is once you establish where the side is, do yourself a favor and give just the slightest little tip in with that. And what that'll do is when you go for your straight cut here, you're going to get that axe because there's going to be that little point that's forming down on the bottom. And just like with the D, we're going to try and cut this real nice and plush. We want this kind of, you know, very, very axe friendly, I guess you could say. We're going to come down here in the bottom. That's a good first one for there. Same thing over here, but instead we're going to tip just in because it's just the other side of that axe. And we're going to cut right along that side. Oop. And we're going right to that guard hair. That's where we're trying to get back to. And where you can kind of see that axe already starting to occur. And then here in the top now, we're going to get this thing kind of facing upward. We're going to do like a fattened mohawk up here. And this is just your base here. So you don't have to get all finishing right here. This is just to kind of get your bearings on which way you're headed with this final cut. can give that just a little bit of a upward angle. Not much. You don't want to get kind of D-like here, but you do want a little upward angle. And then again, looking at that bottom, you're saying, okay, yeah, that's starting to kind of look at So you can kind of get a little wedge off the side here, a little wedge off the side there. And now you're starting to see that. Now, once you get it to this point, whoop, what you should have is kind of your your general perspective here, you're kind of, you're starting to see that, that kind of 
with. Now we're we're far from done here. We gotta we gotta really sharpen this bottom chin, and the way we do that is we just kind of keep coming in with that that blade, and it's okay to lose the undergarment of this pattern as we do this because this chin comes way down. So here we are kind of knifing this through, kind of looking at our sides, making sure we're still getting that nice kind of plane along the sides and we're not getting into our guards yet. We got our nice mohawk still sitting pretty up there, maybe a little extra here. And then right here, once we get to this point, you can kind of see that if we go too much more with that chin that we're going to have some issues. So what we'll do is we'll just kind of go in there and finish that little bit of excess guard hair off. Try and come back and keep your bunny out of it if you can. And we're going to lose that lower guard because again we don't we don't like roller. But what we've done here is we've given ourselves a little bit more blade action so that we can take that that chin even further down in. <laughs> and now right there looking at it we can see that we are starting to get that that axe like and now we're going to really try and plush off these sides before we get any further because we want to make sure that we're staying in line with the eye of that hook in its kind of progression up and finish the axe. Okay, and now the sides finished. Make sure your guards got a nice spread. Make sure your guards are coming out so that you can get all of them to cut. Because you do want all of them so that you can get the most amount of plane out of this. You want that sideward kind of tipping action, I guess you could say. And do remember, you have plenty of material on the top end of this, so having a little gone on the sides is no bad thing. And it'll really promote for that that tipping action. Now for your top here, this one here is going to be grabbing it not by its width but by its scoop. And the scoop of this on the top is what allows us to fish a different variation of presentation on the way back up. Um, and as you know, I don't know if you stream or fish for any amount of time, oftentimes that brown trout is coming up and under that pattern in the, in the last of your presentations on any one cast. If we're fishing the up angle straight from the deepest point that the fly has gotten in the track of its coming across, in which case the leader is down and the sink tip is now coming back in the rod, if we could use the scoop and haul of the writing fly, which is this, to say that that little rattle and all that wire down there on the bottom are doing its job and that axe is keeping this kind of wanting to favor down, we should be able to assume that this is going to be coming up and on top. The water will be coming down on this as we lift it up. Now, we could leave it as is. We'd still get float recovery and all this other cool stuff. But what we can do here is because we've chosen to go with a fattened mohawk here on the top, this to ensure that the writing of this fly is occurring. So no matter what tip I give this thing, no matter what dig and, and travel it gets from one side to the other, the fattened end of this and the security of knowing that the rattle, the ball bearing, and the wire are down here and ensure that this fly is as likely to ride up like this at all times. So we want to use this plane for more than just riding. We're going to add a scoop. And now with these really cool tools here, you can see I'm twisting it. And I'm twisting this in such a way that I get this like really wild hook in the, in the blade here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right here to the tip of my, my little flat plane here. And I'm going to canoe out that little middle. I'm just going to gut it. And when I put that Solaris in there, what I'm going to do is create a scoop. I kind of see that, uh, that eye tipping on them. And that'll go a long way for us. And we want to keep these kind of, you know, kind of right even on that hook just to keep that centered and the, the deer to be driving everything, so to speak. And we're going to take and we're going to give that a good pinch, count to 20 or so. The nice axe points all set up. We got our scoop nice and covered. Our sides are 
flanked out. We're going to take our light. You got to use these things pretty close too. Everybody's using them kind of too far away. We kind of spooned out top the cup with its. It's got a nice profile even from the back of it a little bit. Um, but again, your whole bottom is that premise of the, and that's the axe. The axe was really the big, as it falls, you want it to kind of have an easement to that, but always stay right on the top. I want that, that amount of material up on the top to always remain that way. And so, yeah, that is the Blade Runner. That is a tailwater special. Uh, you could use it in a bigger river as long as you've got enough room for that, that dart and kill, because this one isn't going to get that, sh that short shake and low distance, high action. This is going to be more like... Uh, bigger distances and, and it'll have good action but more of a broken dead action you know we uh, we get too many fish when we pause a fly not to a fish a fly that's fishing dead better these days the fish are getting smarter and in that in that pause and that very erratic action in its fall and, and sway this is a sales pitch we're not tapping enough you know and that's half the reason a big black jig always gets hits on the drop because it looks like it just died and this is more of a swimmy version or a float or a neutral version of that same premise where I'm trying to cup the fall of this with all that flankage on the top kind of falls on that but I still get the splice and the sway and the side but you can see that that springboard right here gives me a lot of extra play when I'm doing my lift and pops and then I get that nice cupping on the back for that fall and that sweep through it's about four years in the making 13 different hooks um, to get to this one which I I probably could say that I knew in the beginning I should have went with but um, yeah that's kind of your you know Blade Runner right there <laughs>